Okay. Um, so for the end of the session, um, I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, so yes, I was moderating the session, but I am also the last presenter. Uh, so just in case we were kind of running late, um, so I put something together. But uh, really when we were going through and looking at all the presentations and uh, trying to provide a variety of presentations for these uh, two-part session, I, I noticed, I'm like, there's nothing on sulfate attack and what would be um, a uh, condition assessment, uh, condition uh, survey without pres presenting any information on a uh, sulfate attack. I absolutely adore sulfate attack. It was uh, the topic of my PhD dissertation uh, in Montreal, uh, Canada. And, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of sulfate attack cases in uh, Quebec. Uh, so then I had to go and move in Oklahoma to go and find one. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, still, um, they're all under litigation and not accessible. So, um, uh, but I was lucky to find one on campus. So that was kind of fun. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about uh, visual condition survey, so lots of pictures because I was really excited to go and walk into one of these uh, underground tunnels. So these are for a steam tunnel. Uh, so we distribute uh, the steam to the buildings and have the condensate return. So these tunnels, uh, they uh, basically contain all of the uh, infrastructure for that. But interestingly enough, we can find very interesting uh, condition survey aspects. So let's just go through. All right, so I'm just gonna really uh, talk about a quick, quick overview of uh, external sulfate attack uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the durability mechanism. And then after that, uh, I will talk about the project. So sulfate attack. And it's kind of bizarre because it is not changing here on this screen. So I apologize if I'm always looking here because I'm not seeing anything uh, going on over here. Um, so external sulfate attack. So if we have buried uh, structure or any type of structure, so if we're exposed to a source of sulfates, it can come from groundwater, it can come from industrial process, um, we can have uh, basically our concrete that is exposed to the sulfates. The sulfates can enter the concrete through concrete pores, uh, in solution, and then after that they migrate through the structure uh, and can do all sorts of interesting things uh, to uh, the structure. So if we take a look a little bit at the concrete and we zoom in, uh, so we can see uh, basically the white surrounding area around the aggregates. Uh, we basically have changes in the cementitious phases all around the aggregate from the sulfates interacting uh, with the cementitious phases. And let's continue. As this progresses, uh, we can kind of see over here around the aggregate, we start uh, losing uh, cohesion. And then after that, we have loss of paste and aggregate uh, bond, uh, which will start affecting the mechanical properties of our concrete. And then as these products uh, start to form, uh, they try and find every single nook and cranny that they can to go and form and expand. So we have here, so this is an air void that is completely filled uh, with um, sulfate compounds. And as this occurs, we have some nice cracks from those uh, expansion mechanisms. They start to cure in our structure, in our concrete, sorry. And then these progress and they form a network of micro cracks uh, which will eventually uh, completely deteriorate your material if you let uh, the attack progress in contact with the source. So really what does that mean? So the nanostructural level, we're looking at a loss in cementing properties and uh, through uh, gypsum metronite corrosion, but really I'm interested in the microstructural and then after the macrostructural aspect. So that loss in paste and aggregate bond and that micro cracking, when we do a visual uh, condition survey, what we're actually gonna see is scaling, delamination, and also that's gonna turn into macro cracking. So what is a visual condition survey? We talked a lot about visual uh, inspection, condition assessment, but really in the realm of the condition survey, 
So we're really looking at identifying those various types of uh, distress. That's the first and foremost important thing. We need to properly identify what we see. So then after that, we can make the proper diagnostic. With that, we need to map them. Okay. So if we're going to uh, prepare a repair scheme or prepare an experimental program to go and take all of those cores and additional information that we want to do in uh, condition assessment, we need to provide uh, maps and also try and have an approximate uh, extent and severity. So there's a few things that we can do during a visual condition assessment. I'm not going to read through all of this, uh, so there's a lot of text here, but really um, trying to identify surface defects, damage, deterioration, also uh, identify uh, signs of corrosion because we do have uh, reinforcement present in most of our concrete structures, so uh, this is important as well. Also, parts, uh, any defective parts, connectors, and joints, especially joint deficiencies. And I'm, we're going to see a lot of joints in some of the pictures that I'm going to be presenting to you. And it kind of led to some of the problems, especially for water ingress. If there's any geometrical features, so any deformations, settlements, things like that, so these also need to be recorded uh, for structural instabilities. And then after that, record water-related issues, especially for durability mechanisms. Uh, if we have water, oh, things can happen. In this case, very important for sulfate attack, but we also saw for freeze thaw. Uh, corrosion, all of these, uh, really if we have water, we need to be concerned. So uh, we're going to see a couple of things for a condition survey that was done for the steam tunnel structures. Here this is purely a condition survey, so there was no engineering assessment that was done, uh, there was no sampling, there was no testing or anything, just confirmation of uh, the salts that were present, and we are going to go through. So just a little bit to situate uh, the project. So it's in Stillwater, Oklahoma at uh, OSU campus. And really the manager is OSU facilities management. Um, so they uh, granted me uh, access to the structure. And here we have the uh, power plant. Over here they produce uh, the steam. And we have the underground structure that's coming out and running along the sidewalk over here. And we inspected approximately um, 500 feet of tunnel. So I'm not going to present pictures for 500 feet, but just a few interesting ones. Just a quick shot here about the tunnel structure. Uh, so we're supposed to have, and I love here, when applicable, uh, perforated drains. I don't know if these were actually present uh, just based on some of the signs um, that we saw um, and also evacuation of water because it was absolutely, there was, I think the drains were not functional. But you can see here all of the utilities are against one wall section which rendered a visual uh, survey very difficult of that wall section. Uh, but we could clearly see uh, the top and the bottom. The entire tunnel is buried but the top section also serves as a sidewalk. So at the top, we could actually, uh, if we were seeing cracks, we could walk the top of the structures and see if they were through and through cracks um, at, um, at the upper level. What was kind of interesting is that, I don't know, steam is very hot. So those tunnels tend to get uh, pretty hot um, during the summertime, but also uh, could reach about 85 degrees Fahrenheit uh, during the winter. So you have concrete that's at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but you have an outdoors um, exposure that could be uh, near to 30 uh, degree uh, Fahrenheit. So just that uh, thermal gradient uh, between the top and bottom, uh, we saw some uh, damage uh, that occurred due to thermal gradients, which I will not talk about in this presentation, but the formation of cracks did lead to further water ingress. So this is what it looks like when we walked in. Lighting was very poor, so uh, we could not really see uh, very well everything. So everything is uh, taken through flashlights um, and uh, also through uh, 
just a flash of the camera to kind of better see some of the details. But you can see all of the utilities here on the side and also uh, the type of wall structure over here. This is the top uh, section, so we could see the sidewalks over here, and this is the top of the tunnel structure, and you can kind of see a series of transverse cracks uh, going all along the sidewalk. On the side, we have a lot of green space. This will become important to try uh, and diagnose what was actually going on. But all of these uh, greenery, we kind of found out after the fact that they were applying uh, sulfate-rich fertilizers, which basically led to uh, the problems um, that we uh, noticed. So let's get into some visual features, signs of distress. So I tried to make these pictures as big and clear as possible. So when uh, we walked in, that's the first thing that we saw, and I got crazy excited. I was like, wow, I hit the jackpot of deterioration. Um, but it quickly died down, the excitement, as we were kind of going through. But if you can just see here, this is the ceiling. Um, and it's kind of scary. I'm like, is this all going to fall on us? Uh, so the first thing that we did, uh, we just basically went in, did a little bit of sounding. And when we had some delamination, uh, we were safely removing all of those uh, ceiling pieces so they would not fall on the students. Uh, not me, but I care about my students. Uh, the students um, doing the uh, inspection. But we can see, so we have uh, severe delamination, severe corrosion, uh, we have salt crystallization uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, it was all white. The first thought was chlorides because we were uh, right next to uh, a section of a street. Also, we apply uh, chloride de-icing salts on the sidewalks. So that was our first initial impression going in. And also, um, carbonation levels are a little bit high. Okay, uh, this is a confined space with poor ventilation. Uh, sometimes we had to get out uh, because uh, oxygen levels were running low. So we actually had to get out of uh, the tunnel while we were doing the uh, inspections. So we thought that um, the corrosion was mainly due to carbonation. So if we take a look here, so um, we have the severely corroded high section loss and more than section loss, we had rebar loss uh, altogether. Um, some of them were completely gone uh, from the section. And we can kind of see here, uh, when we open a delaminated area, and there's supposed to be rebar there, and the question that you ask is, where's the rebar? That is a kind of, uh, it's not a question that you want to be asking yourself. Then after that, we are looking at the joints. Uh, obviously, this joint is not working properly, uh, so it is severely corroded um, as well through accumulation of salts. Uh, it's blocked. It's not functioning to its purpose. And then after that, and I love this word, drummy areas. Um, so once we got past that um, extreme uh, part and then really started to walk through the tunnels, this is what we saw. Initial glance is that the concrete seemed relatively sound. Uh, we weren't seeing any salt accumulation. We're seeing a few cracks here and there, but through uh, just basic sounding, we could hear those drummy areas, those hollow sounds, um, which uh, led us to start to kind of, okay, we're gonna start opening up uh, some of those sections. Uh, facilities management, they just gave us the green light. They're like, if you wanna take off concrete, go ahead. Just, uh, so we were pretty lucky for this. Next, we we're looking at water ingress. So we were noticing, uh, we went in on a rainy day. So all of the joints from the top of the sidewalk, although there was some sealants that were applied uh, over time, it still did not uh, work efficiency. So there was a lot of uh, discoloration through uh, water staining. And again, so we can see here, uh, so we have a transverse crack. We have the wall section over here. Um, a lot of wet areas. 
But when we went on a dry day, uh, which is uh, mostly what we get during the summertime in Oklahoma, basically all of that water is gone and we just have these orange patches. First thought, oh, corrosion stains. So I'm new to Oklahoma, little, little did I know that uh, there's red dirt. So with all of the water infiltration came in uh, all of the clay and silt um, and basically all of the orange staining is not from corrosion but actually just from uh, the surrounding soils. So that was a little bit misleading. But I have a small video. Uh, we went in on uh, one day where, uh, let me see if this is gonna, this is gonna start because I cannot press play here. Oh, there you go. I'm gonna go through here. So we want to get a view on water infiltration and the severity of water infiltration. So this is from a, um, next to a joint. So the joint was not working properly. Uh, the concrete uh, cracked next to it and we have all of the water uh, coming through the crack. So water accumulating on the sidewalk and basically uh, just making its way inside uh, the structure. And, okay. Oh, there you go. There's my comments there. We're, we're not going to show those comments, we're not going to hear those comments, but also along, uh, along the walls. Um, and this is one of the things which uh, we think were pretty much uh, a precursor for the external sulfate attack problems. Gonna, there you go. So on that day, we were just, we walked in, there's just basically waterfalls of uh, water uh, coming in. Um, uh, through every Recorded. single nook and cranny mm -hmm. along the tunnel structure and we ended up with an accumulation of approximately four inches of water um, at the bottom uh, of the structure so it's really just pouring in um, so a lot of the problems that we're going to see is due to uh, water infiltration so on a rainy day you get to see a lot of interesting things which typically uh, next on the rest of the year that we really just could not could not see to that extent. So in those areas, that's where we noticed the biggest delamination problems. Those, um, so at the surface, we can kind of see the wall was starting to bulk inwards. Um, so we had geometry problems in uh, those areas the delaminated panels were just basically coming off uh, in sections. We also have a lot of spalling areas. Uh, so we can see where we had all of the, sol the soil staining, I'm gonna call it soil staining. So the surface was all orange and uh, through water infiltration, concrete was just coming out in big sections. So we can kind of see also repaired areas over here, so previous cracks, about uh, 10 years uh, previous to this inspection, they came in, they just basically patched up all of the cracks. Obviously, the cracks were active, all of the repair material cracked, so there's a lot of map cracking. And then after that, water infiltration on the side of the repair just continued uh, to go on. And we can kind of see uh, some spalling and the lamination occurring. This is where we had the most fun, uh, just basically taking off these huge delaminated chunks. Uh, they were just coming right off in our hands. And then after that, taking a look at what was actually going on behind. And what was really interesting is that when we started taking off these huge delaminated chunks, not only did we see rebar, but we saw a ton of salt accumulation behind. So essentially those sulfates were coming in, they weren't quite reaching the surface uh, combined with uh, the rebar corrosion. They were basically staying in that region. So right behind that first cover crate, so that first two to three inches in cover, they just basically stagnated there and started to do their most damage. So we can see here we have the corroded area, but right around all of the corroded area, the whitish substance here, those are all 
salt uh, crystals. So approximately in cover that we were taking off, we're looking at about that first uh, two and a half inches. The rebar was roughly at about an inch in cover, but really the delaminated areas came right behind that rebar, and this is where all of the salts were accumulating behind that first rebar mat. So as the scaling progressed, we're, we're also looking at delaminated areas. We can kind of see over here all of those white salts uh, accumulating, and that's where, um, when we started seeing that, that's in the buried section, uh, more prevalent at the bottom of the walls, that we started saying, oh, maybe this is an interesting case of sulfate attack. And getting closer, we can really see salt crystallization and scaling due to salt crystallization and uh, common disintegration that comes with it. Here we have the bottom sections. Uh, as we're making our way through the tunnel, further into the tunnel, uh, we have at the bottom of the wall severe disintegration, and we kind of have all of the accumulated material that stayed there with, uh, with time that was never removed. So we were able to take some samples and uh, do some ch uh, chemical analysis to try and determine uh, what was present in terms of elements. Uh, again, here, so we have salt crystallization, uh, scaling or, along the bottom of the wall, along uh, defective joints, cracks, essentially uh, all of the water coming in, uh, we're starting to have basically encrustation. It's no longer, I don't call that salt crystallization anymore, but encrustation of all of these products. So we have a hard coating of material that's basically stuck there, uh, which we had to really remove with a hammer and a chisel. So we took a lot of uh, samples. This is, um, I had no idea what this was. Uh, we called it uh, incrustation, but it really looked like zombie crate. I love it, I just call it, um, that's my zombie crate. Um, just basically um, very hard material, different colors. We took some samples, we did a chemical analysis through um, X-ray uh, fluorescence uh, just to get the elements. We did not do XRD to get uh, the actual uh, compounds, but we found uh, high concentration, concentrations of sulfur, magnesium, calcium, chloride, and uh, also sodium. So going forward, uh, I will to how to put all of this together and provide uh, some meaningful information uh, to uh, facilities management. So we just basically divided everything up in uh, sections and with the condition survey, basically, did exactly what we should do, uh, draw a map, identify every single feature that we saw in this section, and try to provide an idea of severity of the actual features that we saw based on the, based on the sound concrete and also relative to uh, areas that had little features and to areas that had extreme features. So going into uh, severity assessment was really relative to the actual structure. So finally, one of the things that we decided to try um, was to uh, do a staining test with uh, barium chloride, uh, potassium permanganate, to try and identify on site if we were actually looking at sulfate uh, salts. Um, so this is a simple staining test that you can do where you spray uh, barium chloride, potassium permanganate, it really stains. So uh, if you're going to do this, ask permission from your client because you cannot remove the purple color uh, once it's its place. Um, so we stain the structure and then after that we wash it down. So any uh, remaining purple is essentially a combination now of barium sulfate, it's insoluble salt. Uh, so we have the areas that were initially white are now stained in purple, and uh, we can call this uh, barium sulfate. So this is an indication that yes, uh, sulfate compounds were present on the surface of the concrete. So basically, um, besides that, we did not do any further testing. Um, we talked a lot about um, NDT methods. 
we wanted to do NDT methods, um, but they closed the tunnel section. After everything uh, that was there, um, they deemed the tunnel unfit. Um, so they closed the tunnel. We were no longer allowed to go in there. Um, and uh, eventually the tunnel section uh, was um, uh, was basically demolished or backfilled uh, the areas that were deemed uh, structurally unsound uh, through a construction project that was recently conducted on campus. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will take a few questions. If you guys are willing to stay or not, you can, you can go off uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Yes? The, um, that salt deposition behind the, uh, the front face of the concrete wall, is mm. your thoughts as to why it was forming there? Combined with the water infiltration and the severe corrosion, um, as the delamination and detachment was occurring, basically you already kind of had that front that was, create, that was creating. So, it was just staying um, in that uh, moist region and not quite making all the way in through, it's kind of like that evaporative zone that was there. So um, it was starting to crystallize in a region that's still uh, basically the dry region because it was very, very dry environment uh, in the tunnels, if that makes sense. Any other questions? I do not know. It's um, chloride base, but yeah, um, we did not get the full chem chemical information from the um, from the deicing salts that they used. Yes. It's a combination of both. So you, you do have uh, the chemistry uh, with the uh, decalcification and, and etronite and gypsum corrosion and all of those fun things that are happening. But really, when, you, when you're in an evaporative zone, the damage of the physical aspect really prevails. Was it the option for the repair or repair? So, so yeah, so initially they were going to go into uh, potentially a repair and retrofit, um, but then uh, through another project, so they were uh, in the construction of a, a new facilities uh, plant, so they just decided to uh, basically condemn, and now they're going with direct buried instead of uh, uh, using tunnels. So they're kind of shifting and trying to see um, other options. So it was just uh, completely condemned and uh, backfilled or demolished where appropriate. Any potential for when was originally built? And um, originally built in the 40s. So the sections uh, basically uh, varied in year in, of construction, but more or less around the 1940s. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.